Well, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 through 7, and I would invite you to stand once again for the reading of God's Word in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Once again, this is the reading of God's holy word, and God's people said, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and um, we come to a a heavy passage, Heavenly Father, uh, that doesn't look like there's a lot of good news there at all. Um, And Lord, we just pray that as we come to this passage that is, again, very familiar to us in many ways, Lord, we pray that you would uh, open our eyes, uh, no pun intended, to see new things, to see the depth of what sin is, to understand how temptation works, O Lord, that you might help us to stand guard against sin in our own lives and really to see how this speaks of us today, not only of what happened with our first parents. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy and righteous name. Amen. Well, if, if you are like me into Lord of the Rings or, or that whole lore that Tolkien wrote, you would know that uh, the Lord of the Rings was not actually, that trilogy was not the first installment of the story. And in fact, the, the book The Hobbit, which takes place before that, is also not the first installment of that story. But there was a published work uh, by Tolkien's son after his death, uh, compiled uh, stories called The Silmarillion. And those stories chronicle what happened in Middle-earth, which is where all the action of Tolkien's story takes place, um, chronicles how Middle-earth came to be and then what happened before The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is when you begin reading The Silmarillion from the beginning, um, you find that that it describes creation, the creation of Middle-earth and that whole realm where all the story takes place. And the God, the creator God's name literally means Father God, if you were to translate the title that Tolkien gave him. And what's fascinating to me is how this creator God goes about the work of creating is through singing. It's actually kind of a beautiful story in how it starts off. It, it describes the singing and the beautiful melody that has the power to create and bring things forth through the power of the words and the melody. But as as things are created and celestial beings come to life in the presence of this creator God, uh, you find introduced, yourself introduced to one character by the name of Melkor, who is, in my opinion, the Satan character in the story. And what he does is he begins to change the melody to change the harmony, to change the rhythm, because he is the one who wants to produce the music himself. And so he stands against this creator God. And what's, what's fascinating to me is when you think about the imagery that this story produces, 
you know, and you think of how music works with melody and, and rhythm that goes up and down, what we find is, is a picture of what was happening in this passage before us. In fact, we've been listening to the melody of creation and, and God bringing forth life and calling things good. In Genesis 1, we've seen in Genesis 2 the narrowing down of the creative work in the Garden of Eden. And last week, if you were here and joined us or you heard that message online, we saw what I would just call the crescendo of the song of creation in the creation of the woman. That is the high point. And now we sink to the low point in the song. In fact, the whole idea of this particular passage is that mankind fell into sin by doubting, then denying, and finally acting in unbelief of God's word. Mankind fell into sin by doubting, then denying, and finally acting in and unbelief of God's word. That's what unravels before us this morning. Let's take a look at the first point this morning, the doubt that leads to the fall in verses 1 through 3. In fact, let's look at verse 1 first. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Let's stop there really quick and let's look at how this, this doubt finds its root in craftiness. Notice how the serpent is described here. The serpent was craftier than other beasts of the field. Maybe if you're using an older translation, like uh, the King James, I believe, uses the word subtle. It's, it's a word that, that carries a wide variety of meaning in, in the Hebrew language. In fact, it's, if you look in the verse right before this, at the end of chapter 2, verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife we're both naked and we're not ashamed. You know, believe it or not, in Hebrew, the, sa- the word for crafty here is the same exact word for naked in the verse right before it. It's interesting to me that the word that is used to describe Adam and Eve in their innocence, one verse earlier, is the same word that's used to describe the serpent here in the garden. I mean, with that same word, I think really plays a double entendre. And what what Moses is trying to get us to do, what what do you do if you try to catch people off guard? If you try to, you know, sneak in unawares, what do you do? You, You sneak in in a way that might be familiar to them. And it's interesting to me, you know, when you start thinking about a talking serpent and the woman's response to this, you know, how did she not freak out? I think there was more to this story, there was more to the reality than than we realize on the surface. And I think part of the deception is coming in in a way that would not have been, would not have set off alarms and red flags for the woman. He's described as exactly as they were. And yet we know that he's crafty. That, That word carries a nuanced meaning. He's out to do something sinister, but to do it in a way that will not be noticed until it's too late. And we see that craftiness. You have to understand how he was crafty, and we need to explain that a little bit. Now, think about this for just a moment. The woman was created after Adam received the commandment. You go back to chapter 2. If you take a look at that, uh, Adam receives the commandment in verses 16 and 17. Let's take a look at that commandment. Verse 16, you may surely eat of the the, the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, if, if you read that story in order, you know the woman is not yet created. She's created later. What that means is that Adam has to teach his wife God's word. Her reception of God's word, in this case in creation, comes secondhand. And that's really important for how the craftiness of the serpent works his way through this narrative. In fact, when she was created, she was created from the man. In other words, not only does she receive God's word secondhand, From the man, when she's created, she's created from him, meaning that he was the head over her. Again, which means that he has headship over her. 
in this family structure. And so what happens is when we see the serpent in this passage going to the woman, what it does is it reverses the created order of dominion and headship that God had ordained. I don't know if you've ever looked at this passage in that way, but his going to the woman and not to the man was very strategic. In other words, he was going and striking the couple at the most vulnerable place that he can find. Going to the one who's not in authority and going to the one who who received God's word secondhand was his best shot at taking humanity down. This is the craftiness of the serpent. And isn't it interesting that craftiness is always exposed, not on the surface, but in the detail. And so that leads us to the end of verse 1, and then verses 2 and 3, we see this dialogue that leads to doubt. So we, we see the craftiness of how doubt works, but look at the dialogue at the end of verses 1 through Three. Look, at, look at the end of verse 1 first. We see a question that's asked. He says to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, most commentators, when they, when they look at this in the original language, it, it's, it's very choppy Hebrew. I mean, it's, th- there's different opinions sometimes of, of what certain Hebrew particles mean. Again, muddying the waters and highlighting the craftiness of the serpent. Have you ever had someone say something to you, and, and the words might be clear, but it's muddy on what they really mean? That's what's going on here. But the question, I think, is pretty straightforward. He's going after what God had initially said back in chapter 2, verse 16. And I think the ESV does a great job of translating the the nuance of this. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now again, the craftiness is in the details. You go back to verse 16 of chapter 2. That's not what God said. In fact, what did God say? You may surely eat, or you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Notice what the question does. And by the way, guys, the way people frame things is often very important. Whether they're framing it as a statement or they're framing it as a question tells you a lot about where they're coming from. How does he frame this? He paints God in the worst light doesn't he? His very question assumes God in the worst light. What is why? He calls God's generosity and his goodness into question. In fact, when you look back at the original commandment that God gave in verse 16 of chapter 2, you see an uh, incredible goodness and generosity on God's part. Of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. It's amazing. And yet, His very question plants the seed of calling God's generosity and goodness into question into the woman's mind. It assumes from the get-go that God is not good and generous. By its very assumption, it puts the woman on the defensive, almost having to defend God. Now this is interesting because when you look at her response, her response actually falls flat in three particular ways. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. The woman said to the serpent, first problem, by the way, she decided to dialogue with him. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, maybe you're looking at that and you're thinking, well, that that sounds good to me. What's the problem? Well, there's three problems here. First, in verse 2, the woman minimizes the generosity and the goodness of God. And you may ask, well, how does she do that? Well, again, look at verse 2, her response, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Now, again, this is where the subtlety of the serpent, this is where the craftiness taking root in her mind and heart, begins to come out. 
Again, if you go back and you look at chapter 2, verse 16, when God says, you may surely eat, some translations say, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. This is where the subtlety comes in. God uses a double verb in Hebrew. Now, you don't see that in English because it's bad English grammar. But when you see that word surely or certainly in your English translation, usually in the Old Testament, it's a double verb for emphasis. And so when God is giving a double verb for emphasis, you may surely, freely, absolutely eat of every tree of the garden. It is highlighting his goodness. She misses that nuance in her response. And so it shows that that she is is falling prey to, to following the serpent's lead and assuming the generosity and goodness of God is being minimized here. Again, subtlety in temptation. Secondly, in verse 3, the woman's response adds to the strictness of the command. What happens when we start doubting the goodness and the generosity of God, well, even in our own minds, well, then he comes across as more strict. You can see how one leads to the other. Look at verse 3. But God said, so now she's trying to tell him what he actually said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. If you go back to verse 17 of chapter 2, where God gave the prohibition, you'd never see him say that they couldn't touch the tree like that. I mean, feasibly, if they got tired in the middle of the day or in the heat of the day, they probably could have gone and laid against the tree and took a nap in its shade. God never said, don't touch it. She adds that prohibition. I I, I read years ago a commentary by a um, a feminist scholar at a a prestigious university in this country, and she made the statement, well, what what, what Eve is doing is she's, she's doing what the rabbis came to do. She started fencing God's word, and And, you know, this is the problem that Jesus had with the rabbis. They they built fences and walls around God's word. They made the commandments stricter than they really were. Because if you build that fence and and you get people to think this is where the commandments really at, they won't even get close to violating the original commandment. Well, that didn't really go well for the Pharisees, and Jesus pointed that out. And so when the woman adds this response to the strictness of the command, The serpent is not going to miss this. He doesn't miss it. The last thing she does, now she minimizes the generosity and the goodness of God. On the flip side, she adds to the strictness of the command, making God seem more strict. But thirdly then, she minimizes the consequences of sin. Look at verse 3 again. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now again, if you go back to chapter 2, verse 17, I know that this is, may seem a little detailed, but what does God say? The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And what I just shared with you is when you see that, it's usually a double verb for emphasis. It's certainly, absolutely going to happen. She minimizes that and just says, lest you die. And the way that she words that in the Hebrew kind of gives, gives the impression that in her mind, she's thinking that the punishment and the consequence for sin is far off. Not really an immediate danger to her or the man, for that matter. And so it, it's this response uh, that she seems to follow the lead of the serpent and then she she shows her her lack of of understanding or clarity of God's word as it really was. Now, commentators don't always agree, but there's several reasons to explain this. Either one, the man who had the responsibility to clarify and teach her God's word from the beginning, either he failed to do what he was supposed to do adequately, or she wasn't listening <laughs> adequately to what he was saying, or some combination of both. Now, I think the tenor of the passage as we will work our way through Genesis 3 in the next couple of weeks is going to show the onus is, is not as much on her as it is on him. 
I think the problem is here, Adam did not adequately teach her God's word, and her misunderstandings are a reflection on him and his lack of responsibility in teaching her God's word. But we have to take a step back after verse 3 and ask ourselves the question, how are we brought to doubt God's word today? How, how does this apply to us? Well, we're brought to doubt God's word when we come to doubt his goodness and when we fail to adequately grasp what God's word actually says. We're brought to doubt God's word when, when the relationship between God and his word is attacked. That question, did God really say, comes up in a variety of ways in the world around us. It comes up from people who come from other religious backgrounds or maybe cults, right? If you talk to a Muslim person, you know, they deny the authority of the Bible because they claim that it's been corrupted, but then can't prove it. If you talk to a Mormon who might come to your door and you point out something in the scriptures while they're trying to present to you something from the Book of Mormon, their response is going to be, yes, but is that correctly interpreted? In other words, the question is, did God really say? If you go to the halls of modern academia that assume that a supernatural God cannot reveal his word to human beings living in the natural world and then deny the authority of God, what's the ultimate question? Did God really say? Or what about one that's maybe more common to... Many people, even in the church, if you're talking about something you disagree with them on, they might say, well, isn't that just your interpretation? Sometimes that's a legitimate thing. You know, there are things Christians can legitimately agree with, and I get where they can certainly disagree in interpretation, but where some things are clear. When somebody says, well, that's just your interpretation, what are they saying? Did God really Brothers and sisters, when people put a distance between God and his word, that is the beginning of a downward slope that really has no bottom at the end. So we need to be aware of that when we think about temptation. And it's not just things that we hear on the outside. It's the way our hearts reason within us, isn't it? when we're presented with an, op an option and an opportunity to sin. Well, did God really say? And the question is, are we going to believe what God's word says? Or are we not? And moreover, we're brought to doubt God's word when we are not clear on what it says. Now, there's something about this woman that every single one of us shares in common with her. And that, that thing is that none of us in this room were present when God revealed his word to the apostles and prophets. Like the woman, we are hearing it, even by reading it on our own, we're hearing it secondhand through the prophets and the apostles. And so again, that, that begs the question, are we going to pay specific and special attention to what it says, or are we just going to give it a cursory reading and assume that we know it all? Right? There really is a challenge here. And the challenge and the way it applies here, I think, has several layers. And I'll, I'll give a few of these layers for you as an example. First, just as it was Adam's responsibility as the head of his family to teach his wife and then ultimately their children God's word, for our purposes today, brothers and sisters, this reveals the need particularly and the responsibility for husbands to labor within your own families to adequately teach your wife and your children what God's word says. Now let's be honest, some of you, your wives, may know more of God's word than you, but that does not absolve you of your responsibility to live by God's word in your families. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 says, it tells fathers, 
to talk of God's word when they sit down or when they walk on the way, whether they lie down or when they rise up in the morning. In other words, he's saying, look, God's word applies to all of life, so talk about it during all of life, not just some of life, like on Sunday for an hour or two. Make sure you're leading your wives and your children, brothers, in family devotions at least a few times a week. Some of my friends in, in ministry and other Christian friends, uh, they read the scriptures with their families over dinner and they talk about it with their wives and their kids. Um, others will discuss the sermons on the way home from church with their kids and their teenagers. Others I know catechize their children. I know as we, we I, I just read the other day through the, all of the reports that, are gonna be pre- that have been presented to you and are going to be given to you today in the congregational meeting and you know the children's ministry report mentioned uh, working through the new city catechism. Wonderful. You know, are, are, we, are we reinforcing those things in the home is the question. Secondly, the, the, the la- second layer I would say is for those of us who are in leadership in the local church are to ensure that we're sufficiently in God's word for ourselves. Boy, that means me most of all, doesn't it? Since I'm the one up here. Are we in God's word so that we might adequately teach and pour into those whom God has given us to care for them spiritually. This is why I choose to preach here at Liberty through books of the Bible, to give you the big picture, to get into the details, so that you are prepared and adequately know, to the best of your ability, what God's Word says. This affects the way we do our Sunday school with our teachers and our classes. One of the ways that we're looking to apply this, particularly with men, is we're looking to actually start up a new men's ministry on Saturday mornings in the beginning of March. I've had several conversations with some of you men who have asked me, what kind of ministry are we going to do for men? And you're absolutely right. And so this is one of the things we're going to do. Men, if you're 20 or older... I'm not going to fight with you if you're like 19, okay? But if you're like 20 or older in general, it's a ministry that's designed for you. Why? So that you are prepared to get into God's Word. That you might be prepared to lead the way that God calls you to. And not in the way that Adam clearly failed in this passage. And third is a more individual way to apply this is we all, whether men or women, have the need to be reading God's word on a regular basis in our own lives. I know this sounds cliche. I know I've said this before from the pulpit, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record. But brothers and sisters, when Jesus was tempted uh, by Satan in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he was not joking when he responded to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the question is, do we see God's word? Do we see this as a life or death issue? Or do we see this as something that's just an add-on that we can really just not really care too much about? We can get on without it. Because the prophet Hosea in chapter 4, verse 6, God says to Israel as they're in their sin and they're not living out his word, he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And then he turns around in Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, like Adam my people have broken the covenant. Why? Because they didn't know God's word. And so we see doubt is the first kind of stage here in this fall. But in verses 4 through 5, it brings us to our second point. It doesn't just stay with doubt. Now we have the denial that leads to the fall. We had the doubt that led to the fall was our first point. Our second is the denial that leads to the fall. Take a look at how this works in verse 4. The denial through contradiction. But the serpent said to the woman, now he does not miss a beat. The serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. 
Now there's that word surely again, and I, I've hit on that twice now this morning. He denies what the woman just said about the penalty, about death. But notice what he does. He denies the death penalty for sin with the same force that God said it. That's where he doesn't miss a beat. It's almost like he's correcting the woman with the, a false presentation of what he's saying is true. Now notice what that contradiction does. It presents two equally absolute truth claims. Either what God is saying is absolutely true, if they sin, they will die, or the serpent's truth claim is absolutely true, they will sin and not die. Notice what this does. It puts the woman in the place of being the arbiter and the judge and the determiner of what is true and false. And what is the means by which she's going to have to do that? She's going to have to put those claims to the test. Right? How many of you were like told, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think in your mind. <laughs> How many of you were told at one time, like when you were little, you know, you're standing in the kitchen and your mom's cooking and the stove is hot. Don't touch that stove, it's hot. Now I'll be honest, I can't remember touching the stove, but knowing me and what I was like as a kid, I was probably the kid that looked at my mom when she said that and just, you know. <laughs> There's a truth claim. And you put it to the test. And by putting it to the test, what are you saying? You are saying that I don't trust you, even though I probably had every reason to trust my mother. I don't trust you. And I have to test for myself to determine if what you're saying is true. And until I test it, I cannot trust you and believe you. Now, the, the serpent doesn't just give a denial through this contradiction of God's word. Well, what he does is he goes a step further and gives a denial through giving her a half-truth. Now, on the surface, you would think maybe he's walking his claim back and, okay, I'm going to give you half the truth. No, he's actually digging in further. Look at verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay. <laughs> How is that a half-truth? Well, just walk through the clauses and tell me if it's true. He says, for God knows. Does God know? Yeah, He knows everything. <laughs> for when God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Will their eyes be opened? Yeah. And you will be like God. Will they be like God? Yeah, in a sense. God admits that later. How, how will they be like God? Knowing good and evil. Will they know good and evil? After, yeah. You tell me what is false about what the serpent said. Brothers and sisters, this is the subtlety of sin. This is the subtlety of temptation. This is the subtlety and the craftiness of the serpent. He states things that are all true. It's not what he says. It's what he doesn't say. And what he leaves out. Isn't that interesting how half-truths work? Sometimes, everything somebody could say is true. But the motive and what they're leaving out is the truth that's missing. Think about that. They will be like God. What's he saying here? What's he insinuating about God? He's insinuating when he says that God knows that in the day you do this, this will happen. He is saying God is holding out on you. He's withholding something good from you because of what he knows. So not only is God holding out on you, what is that? When someone holds out on you on something, why do they do it? Well, usually because they're selfish. Those are very subtle claims to make about the character of God. He knows that you will be like Him, knowing good and evil. By the way, if you go forward to verse 22, you, you see that that's true. God Himself acknowledges that after the fact. The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. 
So again, we have to kind of take a step back. How does denial of God's word affect our view of God? Well, the denial of God's word, not just the doubt, but the denial is always built on the fatal delusion that we have the authority to stand in judgment over whether God's word is true or not, and therefore to stand in, or in judgment over God himself. There's a famous book by a guy that I normally really like, Josh McDowell. I think it was Josh McDowell. It might have been C.S. Lewis. Um, one way or the other, I like them both. And the title of the book remains the same. It's God in the Dock. God in the Dock. And it goes through arguments and evidence for the existence of God and the truthfulness of his word and things like that. And while I think those things have value, the title gives us a false assumption, doesn't it? It gives us the assumption that God is the one, you know, on the dock and we're, we're sitting in the seat of the judge and it's up to us to determine whether God is acquitted or not. Where does that fatal flaw come from? It comes from this. It comes from the idea of grasping to be God. And that's the fundamental problem that the man and the woman have here when they're presented with two competing truth claims, one from Satan and one from God, they presume to have the authority to judge between them by putting those truth claims to the test. In other words, brothers and sisters, they're claiming to have authority that only God has in the desire to be like God. Now we see, we see this today in the radical individualism all around us that presumed where people presume to have the power and authority to define who they are they assume they have the authority to determine what is true and false for them they claim to have the authority to determine what is morally right and morally wrong or what is good and evil for them essentially what they're doing is based on this lie. You see, Jesus in John 8, 44 said that the devil was a liar from the beginning and that when he speaks, he speaks out of his own character. Have you ever wondered, in our day and age especially, why when you contradict somebody or you don't affirm them in their sin, have you ever wondered why they melt down so furiously and get so angry? Have you ever wondered? I mean, you've been, particularly some of you who are older, you look at this and you're like, nobody acted like that in my day. What happened? Well, I got news for you. It's, it's nothing new. It goes back to this. What you're seeing, essentially, is the wrath of somebody who's claiming to be God. And you refuse to acknowledge that they are God. And all the pronouncements that as God they make. And what you're seeing is a rat, the wrath of all these little gods walking around thinking they have the authority to do this. Brothers and sisters, if we deny reality, the reality, the truthfulness, and the goodness of God's word, then, like the rest of the world around us, we are left in the precarious situation of having to create and define those things for ourselves. The problem is, when we look at this fall of man into sin in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, what we find is that when we define and create these things for ourselves, and we presume to be God, we end up ruining our lives and we plunge them headlong into death. And it's not just our lives. Our sins never just affect just us. They always affect those closest to us most profoundly, don't they? And so denying God's word, brothers and sisters, is a denial of him. Because at the heart of every denial is the belief that God is not good. It's the belief that God is withholding something good from us and that we can do better than him. If you want to really understand the, the progress of temptation and how it works and moves, you know, it progresses on the strength 
and the belief in the lies that we are told about God and his character and his goodness. Notice, notice what's going on here with the woman. She was given access freely to every blessing and every pleasure in the garden with the exception of one tree. And what does Satan do? He leveraged that one tree, the one thing she couldn't have, to turn it around and call God's entire goodness and character into question. And what happened? In the process, well, that one thing became more desirable to her, as we'll see in our next point, it became more desirable to her than God himself. And that's what happens to us. The one thing that we think God is withholding from us, whatever that thing might be, becomes the one thing that we supplant God in our hearts and minds, and that thing becomes more desirable because God is the one who in his unfairness is not giving us what we want. And fundamentally, that is the root of unbelief, isn't it? Let's turn to that in our last two verses. In verses 6 through 7, our third point is the unbelief that leads to the fall. We've seen the doubt. We've seen now the denial. Now look at the unbelief. Now you see what's going on in the internal workings of this woman and the internal workings of her unbelief in verse 6. Take a look at verse 6. After this conversation... So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now I'm gonna, I want you to look at the, the verbs here that are related to the temptation. There's really three of them. First is she saw that the tree was good for food. What happens when you start believing the lie? Well, then you start calling what God calls not good, good. That's what she did. She's she's seeing that what God said was not good for her and will lead to her death. She sees it as good for food. What does food do? It brings life. It preserves life. You can call this the lust of the flesh if you want. She sees the tree as good to satisfy a desire of the flesh, in this case, hunger. Secondly, the tree was a delight to the eyes. You know, when I did some digging in this, I was, I was actually kind of surprised to learn that word delight there is the same Hebrew word that's used in the 10th commandment in Deuteronomy 5.21 when it says, do not covet your neighbor's house, you know, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, anything that is your neighbor's has to do with coveting. Well, what's the nature of coveting? Well, you see something that someone else has that rightfully belongs to them, and you want it for yourself. You, you take delight in that, in what you see, and then you want. In this case, the tree belonged to God. He created it. He had every right to put a parameter around it. She wanted what belonged to him. That was what belonged to God, and God alone was a delight to her eyes. By the way, you could probably call that the lust of the eyes. How about that? Lastly, the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Okay, this is a similar word, desired, but it's a word that's used in Haggai chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, when in God, they're rebuilding the new temple after the exile, and, and God says he's going to bring the desire of the nations into that temple. And then in verse 8 of Haggai 2, he goes on and says, The gold is mine, the silver is mine. The desire of the nations is is kind of significant because it points to wealth. And if you're wealthy, what are you? You're you're seen as successful. You're powerful. And, And the idea of making one wise, this is not like an intellectual knowledge and just stays in your head. Wisdom in the in the biblical mindset is not just knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's knowledge for a practical purpose. It's knowledge that brings power. It's knowledge that brings success. It's knowledge that brings wealth. That's what this woman is desiring here. She's looking at the tree. It's another form of coveting, but a different shade of coveting. That's what's going on inside her heart. She's 
processing what she's going to do. And then we see the verbs and how this relates. I, I'm not going to take any real time to describe these. They're pretty self-explanatory. She took, she ate, she gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate as well. By the way, notice he is entirely passive in this whole ordeal, failing in his responsibility to lead. I think if we're honest men, this is a problem that plagues every one of us to one extent or another. And the result of this unbelief is in verse 7, and it's tragic. It's tragic. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, it's not the fact that they were naked in the first place that was some, there was something was wrong. We saw at the end of chapter 2, they were naked and not ashamed. Why were they naked and not ashamed? Because they had original righteousness. That's what the Westminster Standards tell us. It's a great interpretation. I think it comes right out of a solid reading of this passage. They had original righteousness. They had nothing to be ashamed of. They didn't do anything wrong until they did. And when they did, then they became aware of their nakedness. They lost the covering of that original righteousness that gave them no shame. And now they have shame. They've got something to hide. That's what's going on. So what do they do? By the way, if you notice, that serpent's half-truth became a reality, didn't it? They, their eyes were open, just not in the way that they were anticipating their eyes were going to be open. And in response, they sew fig leaves together for loincloths. What a pitiful, pitiful attempt to recover what they lost. They lost righteousness as a covering. And what do they turn to as a result? Leaves. I'm not saying that to mock them. I'm just saying that by way of observation and reality. They lost that original righteousness and they seek to cover it by their own provision. So how does this unbelief work out in our hearts today leading to sin? Well, unbelief is simply the result of, again, doubting and denying the truthfulness of God's word. But when you do that, when you fail to believe what God's word says, it leaves us open and defenseless to temptation which will then always result in a fall into sin. And I want you to see, brothers and sisters, you know, it's one thing I always hear when people are like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to ask God, I'm going to ask Adam when I get to heaven, how in the world did you fall? Like, how did you let that happen? No, you won't. You won't ask him that. <laughs> because we are all tempted in the same ways that Adam and Eve were tempted here. And many times we fail, don't we, if we're honest? Even as Christians, we fail. You know, the first thing that we all need to see, first and foremost, is that all sin, all sin is rooted in unbelief in God's word and his promises. And did you notice that all those verbs, she saw the tree was good for food, the tree was a delight to the eyes, the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Did you realize that that connects directly to what we just went through last fall in 1 John, particularly chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. You remember that what he said there? But, <laughs> the what does he say? He says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these things are not from God. Those are the things that are tied to this world system. And he says there in 1 John 2, 17, these things are passing away. Right? That's what he's getting at here. And we need to see that there is, while, while we have the same experiences of temptation that Adam and Eve faced, categorically, we also need to see that there is no temptation that we've experienced that doesn't have its seeds right here. Sometimes I hear people when they're talking about their sin, or I'm trying to, as a pastor, or even as just a Christian friend, trying to work with people through sins that they struggle with, I always hear them say, yeah, but you don't understand. Look what I'm really going through. 
well, okay, maybe, I, maybe I'm not grasping what you're telling me, but fundamentally, you're no different than anybody else. There's nothing you struggle with, brothers and sisters, here that is unique to just you. How do I know that? Well, because of this passage. But I know that also because of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will per also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. So here's the question. Where do we find the power to resist temptation then? If we're struggling in all the same ways that Eve does, are we doomed to fail every time? No. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the fall of man points to the need for the victory that is found in Jesus Christ. The source of your victory is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's the second Adam. Where the first Adam fails... The second Adam is victorious. Think about it for just a moment. They are in the best of environments. They're in paradise. They have every need met. Adam and Eve had a position of advantage and superiority over that serpent. And they failed. Jesus is the second Adam is, is a little different in the sense that he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights fasting. He has none of his material provisions met. He's in a tremendous position of weakness, at least physically, after 40 days of not eating and drinking anything. But like Adam and Eve, he deals with the serpent directly, and he prevails. And by the way, he deals with the serpent in all the same ways that Adam and Eve do. Professor John Currid, uh, formerly of Reformed Theological Seminary, likens Jesus' temptations to this. The temptation to make bread from stones would have satisfied a need of the flesh, hence relates to the lust of the flesh. The temptation with the glory of all the kingdoms of the earth would have satisfied the lust of the eyes. Remember what Satan did? He showed him in a moment all of the kingdoms and their glory. Tried to show him something attractive that would appeal to the eyes. And the temptation to call forth the angels at his beck and call when he threw himself off the temple. I should, should have said if he would have thrown himself off the temple. Related to the pride of life, which is power. Because essentially he would have said, look, not even this could kill me. Pride of life. And yet Jesus defeated Satan, didn't he? And that defeat was on our behalf, not just his. And it wasn't just in the wilderness that he defeated Satan, was it? He was again tempted in the garden to walk away. <laughs> right before going to the cross. And then what does Paul say in Philippians chapter 2? He says about Jesus that he was obedient unto the point of death, even death on a cross. I want you to think about this for just a moment, and I will close with this. Because it really highlights the gospel, I think, beautifully. If Adam obeyed, Adam's obedience would have led to life, and life abundantly. Christ's obedience led to death. But it wasn't just death on a cross. Christ's obedience ultimately led to a greater life in the resurrection. Where do you find the strength, brothers and sisters, to fight sin? In the cross, in the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. What does Paul say in Galatians 5? Those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its desire, passions and desires. Why? Or for what purpose? So that they might bear sin 
the fruit of the Spirit. Which is eternal life, ultimately, isn't it? But as we think of sin, mankind fell into sin by doubting, then denying, and finally acting in unbelief of God's word. Now I know that may sound really heavy to leave off on, but next week we will look at God's response to sin And there is good news to find in that response. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we have just heard and in some cases have been warned in your word about how insidious and crafty and subtle temptation is and sin. And and unfortunately for us, Lord, it's not just sin from Satan that comes at us. It's sin from the world and even sin from our own flesh now. But Lord, we thank you that we don't have to dwell on and focus on the first Adam. We can dwell on and focus on the victory of the second Adam and find strength in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we wait to hear next week of your gracious response, we pray that you would help us to cling to the victory of Christ this week as we battle and face our own flesh, uh, the world, and the devil as we seek to walk in obedience and sanctification this week. Help us to glorify you in all that we do and to see the lies that are presented as they're presented. Help us to see them for what they are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I would invite you in response. Let's, let's turn in our hymnals and